And while the kids are dismissing, I would encourage you to take your Bibles with me to the book of James. To the book of James this morning. Man, I'm so glad to see all y'all smiling faces. I love you all. Appreciate you guys. We will be looking at a very familiar portion of Scripture, and um, we're going to look at this passage. Um, Faith in Action is our sermon series, but we're going to be seeing today where James challenges people who are believers in Christ to show me your faith. Um, Sadly, this portion of Scripture is misinterpreted by many to uh, think and believe that they need works to earn their way in favor uh, to God, but the Bible does not teach that. It says, without faith, as it is impossible uh, to believe, or to uh, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Um, we know that we are saved by grace through faith, and not of works, lest any man should boast. Um, we believe that uh, God has given us salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, you can see the entire. Uh, Council of Scripture teaches that. Uh, sadly, what happens is, is people take one portion of Scripture, don't weigh it against the entire counsel of the Word of God, and understand what James is trying to say here. So we are going to see how our faith is put into action and what genuine faith looks like. And so now that you're in James chapter 2, follow with me through verses 14 through 26 here this morning. The Bible says, what Doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man say, man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seeing thou how faith wrought with with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Let's pray this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity and the blessings and the ability to be in the house of God this morning. Lord, I pray now that you use me as an instrument vessel in your hand. You hide me behind the cross at Calvary. You give me clarity and thought and clear speech as I stand to proclaim the very word of God. Lord, I pray for the people that are sitting in the pews here this morning that uh, the word of God does not go just from one ear out the other, but it goes from the ear uh, to the heart. We truly wish and hope and pray that the word of God changes, affects, convicts, encourages each individual person, Lord. I pray that if there is someone here amongst us that has never called upon your name and trusted in you and you alone for their salvation, that today be the day of salvation for them. I pray that they pass uh, from death unto life. I pray for the wayward and the backslidden Christian, Lord. I pray for restoration. I pray for healing, Lord. I pray that you, as the Holy Spirit, the great physician, do what you do best. Lord, I pray now that uh, you be with us, Lord, and that you change our lives uh, through the word of God here this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
The book of James is a very practical book. It is a book um, written by many people believe and think to be James, the brother of Jesus Christ. James was the half-brother of Jesus, and uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, didn't come to faith in Jesus Christ until after the resurrection. He didn't believe and understand and fully comprehend that his brother was the Messiah. They didn't realize that he was God manifest in the flesh. And so many people believe that James here, the writer of this book, was the brother or the half-brother of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we can understand as James is writing to this writing this book uh, to uh, the 12 tribes that have been scattered abroad. Uh, what that means essentially is the nation of Israel had been scattered. Uh, they were living all over the Roman Empire. And he is writing this letter to those individuals. Now, I want you to understand that people will take, uh, the, take their salvation. They will take grace to an extreme. They'll say, I'm saved by grace through faith and that nothing else matters. I can sin. I can live my life any which way I want to. I can do however I please. Uh, that is not what the scripture uh, has to say. And they take this kind of, I don't want to say fatalistic uh, approach or this uh, laissez-faire type approach. But we can probably see here that James is encouraging uh, the 12 tribes. And just like he wrote to those 12 tribes, it applies much to us today uh, or applies exactly to us today. And so we get into this portion of scripture in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. He talks about putting our faith into action. Last week, we looked at the letter of Philemon, how Paul wrote to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus. He was a runaway slave, and he had stolen things when he had left. And he was asking Philemon to forgive Onesimus, because sadly, uh, the punishment and payment for that crime for running away was uh, to be put to death. And he's saying, hey, receive uh, Onesimus, not as a slave, but as a brother in Jesus Christ. He is elevated above more than just your slave and your servant. And so we can see that restoration, faith being put into action. And so today we see the real crux of faith being put into action. And so we will continue on uh, moving forward where James says, show me your faith. Faith without works is dead. And this is a common theme that you can kind of see throughout the letter of James. You can see in James 1.22, he says, but be ye doers of the word. He says, I want you to do the word of God. What did Jesus tell us before he died and ascended into heaven? Well, we can think of several things. The first thing is, is he tells us that we are called to love God. He says, uh, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul. And then that we are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. And then the final and lasting words before he was ascended into heaven, he great, gave the great commission to the believers and to the disciples. And he tells us to go into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature, to make disciples, to baptize, to teach people the very word of God. And so he says here, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And so we can see here that even in the beginning parts of this letter, James is saying, hey, be doers of the word, love God, love others, share the gospel. And guess what? Isn't that our mission statement here, church? It is our mission to love God with all our heart, with all our mind, all our soul. He should be the number one here at Grace Baptist Church. As John the Baptist said, I must decrease and he must increase. We ourselves must decrease and we must increase Jesus Christ. And so as we can see here, the entire letter is essentially full of Faith without works is dead, showing faith. And so he talks about being doers of the word, not hearers. He talks about favoritism is condemned in chapter 2. He talks about how the tongue is unruly and is on fire and it is impossible to tame and we should do our best to control our tongue. It talks about earthly wisdom. It talks about drawing near to God, rejoicing in uh 
and do not rejoice and boast in evil. He talks about how the rich are oppress, uh, represses and rebukes uh, those individuals, examples of suffering. Uh, this book is a rich book about putting your faith into action. And so I want us to first and foremost look at what James is saying in verses 14 through 17. He's talking about dead faith is rebuked. And so in verse number 14, we see what is the profit of faith or dead faith or what has faith. He says, what doth it profit my brethren, uh, though a man say that, say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him. And so the ending part of this portion of verse number 14, I would say, yes, can faith save you? Yes, it can. Uh, because we look at the entire council of scripture and we can say that by grace are you saved through faith. But that's not what James is trying to write here. He's writing a rhetorical question to those 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. He says, what doth it profit? What good does it do, my brethren, though a man say that he hath faith? You can say that I have faith and that I believe in God. And we'll see in a moment as we draw through the letter, he says, uh, the demons believe in God and tremble. And so there is a difference between believing in God and having faith in God and then truly having a relationship with Jesus. Christ. There's one thing that I know for certain is when you pass from death unto life, you are radically changed by the Holy Spirit of God. The dead spirit that was inside of you is now made alive. And I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit lives, resides in you. And so the Holy Spirit, you being a transformed believer in Jesus Christ, should motivate you and should change you. And I want you to understand, we talk about the Bible. The Bible talks about out of the contents of the heart comes what uh, comes out of the mouth. And so if you listen to someone very long, you will start to understand uh, what their heart is by how they speak, how they act, and what they do. And so we can see here, as James is writing in verse number 14, he says, that though many say he hath faith and have not works. He says, uh, works of deeds, things that are you doing and trying to help and trying to uh, love one another. And he'll give an example here in just a minute. But I want you to understand is one way that we show that we have faith, one way that we show that we are believers in Jesus Christ, it is by the works and actions and things that we say on a day in and day out basis. That might be difficult to understand, but... Um, I don't think it is. And so I would challenge you here this week is in today and you sitting here. How is my faith being put into action? How am I living out my faith for Jesus Christ? I don't want you to be a Christian just on Sunday mornings from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock. We are Christians 24-7. You have been enlisted in God's army. You are a child of God, and you are called to bear witness of Jesus Christ everywhere you go. And so my question is to you, is your faith producing good works in your life? Now, like I said, good works do not save you. It does not earn you favor with God because all your righteousness are as filthy rags in the eyes of God. But how is your works, how is your faith produced in your works? And so he says, what is the profit in verse number 14? But we can see the example that he gives in verses 15 and 16. He says, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? So you who sees one in need, I want you to understand he's giving a very specific example. He goes from the macro view to the micro view. This is his second of the rhetorical questions. He's not exactly looking for an answer. It's more uh, to thought-provoking questions that he's asking to the 12 tribes and that we ask ourselves today. And it says, what if we see a brother or sister in Christ? What if we see someone outside the church that is in desperate need and we can meet that need? 
I can, I can tell you, I don't have much to give, but one of the things that I can give uh, to people a lot of times is my mechanical experience. I'm a plumber by trade. I was a helicopter mechanic by trade, and I'm physically able to do things. And so those are ways that I try to minister and to help people. He's speaking of the example of providing basic needs for people, someone that uh, is destitute and doesn't have clothes. If we have something to give, we should be able to give it uh, to another person. That's where it goes back in what we were talking about giving. We talked about giving of our finances, giving of our treasure, but it's more than just treasure, right? We give of God of our time. How are we serving God with our time? Do you, how much time do you devote to serving God throughout the week? How much time do you give to your devotional life and growing deeper in your spiritual walk with Jesus Christ? Like I had mentioned, we're going to be giving out these tracts, and I encourage you to take one and pass it out to somebody this week or today, whenever you can. But another thing we'll be focusing on is discipleship and growing deeper in our relationship with Jesus Christ and becoming more mature, more mature Christians. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, 2, commit thou things unto faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. It is our goal and responsibility to replicate ourselves. And so we can see here as he's talking, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, how are we going to meet that need? Are you going to, as in verse number 16, if you are able, and say, one of you say unto them, depart in peace, go as you see fit. Or I'm going to give you blessings, brother. I hope that you have a good day. I know that we all have been guilty of this said statement, have we not? And the Holy Spirit convicts me each time I do it. And I fail to rise to the occasion sometimes that God gives me these opportunities to be a blessing to somebody. I always tell you, church, when you come to church, don't, look, don't come to church looking for a blessing. Come to church looking to be a blessing. And if you come to church looking to be a blessing, you in turn shall and will be blessed. And so God gives, these, gives us these opportunities to be a blessing to other people. And so he says here, go depart in peace. You're not showing your faith through your actions. You're showing um, what you are not made of. And he says, depart in peace, be warm and filled. He says, you know, go, you're, go, and, uh, and go enjoy, uh, go put on some clothes and get some food, but you're not going to be the person that, that gives them. Say, I'll be praying for you, brother. I hope you have a good day. And so we see here in the latter part of verse number 16, he says, Notwithstanding, ye give them those things which are needful uh, to the body. Not those things which are needful to the body. He said, what doth it profit? What good is it if you are not going to meet that need? What good is it if you can meet it and you don't do it because you're selfish or you uh, don't care or you're apathetic? He says, what good are you doing? So in verse number 17, he speaks to uh, the heart of the matter here. He says, even so faith, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. You know, that reminds me of the book of Matthew. Jesus talks about the false prophet and how they're going to come and you'll know them by their fruit. We'll be known by our fruit, church. We'll be known by what we produce, what we sow, and what we shall reap. He says, even so, faith. You might say that you have faith, but if you're not exemplifying it and showing it and carrying out your faith and showing it to people, then it is dead. Oftentimes we see someone make a profession of faith and we believe them and take them at their word. And we say, you know, we, we know and believe that this person trusted in Christ. But uh, if that person then falls by the wayside and they never change, you kind of call into question their salvation. It's not us up to us to look at someone's salvation, look at someone's faith. And make judgment, but we can look at the fruit that it has produced. And so he's saying here, even so faith, 
And church, let me challenge you this morning. How am I going to challenge myself? How am I going to live out my faith when I leave Grace Baptist Church this afternoon? Because he says simply, faith, if it hath not works, it's dead. I mean, it's good for nothing. You might have faith, but you're not reproducing. You know, sadly, we can understand through some research and studies that only like less than 1% of the church will ever, ever lead someone to Christ. Think about if all of us were zealous for reaching people for Jesus Christ. What kind of impact? If each one of you brought one person, think about what the sanctuary would look like. If we each one reached one, if our faith produced action, right? And so he says, faith without works is dead. He says, it's being alone. It's by itself. It has no fruit. It shows that it is dead. And so we can see he goes on to say in verses 18 and following, 18 through 20, we see faith seen. And so he challenges those people in verse number 18 to simply say, Yea, a man may say. He's making a generalized statement. He says, A person might say this, Thou hast faith and I have works. He says, You know, Scott, you have faith, or I have faith and you have works. Right? Sorry, I'm picking on you, Scott. Your haircut looks great, by the way. But he says, Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. He says, you can say that you're a believer in Jesus Christ all day long, and you continue to live like the devil. You continue to come. You might come on Sunday morning and get dressed up and come in and uh, put on your best show, but as soon as you walk out, uh, the world has influenced you, and you still act like what you were before you came in. He's saying it's all fine and dandy for you to say that you have faith. He says, but I'm going to show you my faith through my works. I'm going to show you how much I love Jesus. I'm going to show you how much Jesus has changed my life. I'm going to show you how radically different that I am. I'm going to do that by helping others. I'm going to do that by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know many of you all love sports, right? Crazy about the National Predators, the Tennessee football. Um, I don't know if we have any Chicago Cubs fans in here, baseball fans. We've got a few. Um, you guys love it, right? And sometimes I engage in conversation. Some of you are motorcycle fans, car fans. I, can, I, I pick up really quickly what people love and what their hobbies are, right? Because they're quick to go out and show me their brand new toy or their uh, team that's winning. And they're like, hey, man, we're, we're going to the playoffs. Or, hey, man, we're, uh, check out my car that I got. Hey, man, check out my motorcycle. Or, hey, man, check out my lawnmower. That's a thing nowadays. Yeah. Our actions are produced by things that we love, right? We like to talk about things that we love and we are passionate about. I've felt convicted lately. I've, I have seen pictures of auditoriums filled with people on Sundays where snow pouring down. They're chanting like animals and crazy people for a team that's throwing a pigskin and it has no eternal value but we can't get people here to serve and show faith and action for the living God. We have so many people zealous about politics these days. That room went quiet, did it not? I'm not going to advocate for any uh, political party here, but I want to say this is that we get so zealous about politics, right? We become so radical. I had a lady come to my door the other day, knocking on my door, trying to advocate for somebody for sheriff in my neighborhood. I said, man, if we could just motivate the church to be just as zealous for a sheriff as we did for Jesus Christ, think about how many people we could reach with the gospel, right? 
Good night. We get people canvassed, like, drive down the road here. You'll see all the political signs. What if we were that zealous for Jesus Christ? And guess what? Jesus Christ brings eternal life. One day there is a guarantee we will all die if Jesus does not return. And that is the only thing that matters. Not money, not politics, nothing. Jesus Christ and Him alone. So let me ask you this question. How are you showing your faith? Is it through the works of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ? Is it showing the love of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ met the needs of people. He healed the sick. He fed uh, the poor. He clothed the individual who was destitute. Show me your faith through your works. As we continue on down through here, he says in verse number 19, and I made reference to this, he says, Thou believest that there is one God. We believe that there is one God, and there is three persons of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we believe God the Holy Spirit is a person. He is not in it here this morning, church. He is a person. And he's saying to the believers that are scattered abroad, the the 12 tribes, and I'm saying to you this morning as a church, we believe that there is one God. He says this, thou doest well. He says that is a good knowledge. That is a good theology. He says, but this, the devils also believe and tremble. And I think this is where he hits the heart of their faith. He's saying, guess what? The devils also believe that there's a God. But their belief causes them to tremble and have fear. What separates a person with faith without works in those individuals who are the devils and the demons? Nothing. He says, you both believe in God. Our faith should transform us and change us. And created as something that wants to serve, love, and help uh, others. Faith without works is dead. So in verse number 20, he says this, But wilt thou know, O vain man? I want you to understand, vanity means emptiness, fruitlessness, fruitless. O fruitless man, O vain, empty man. A man that has no works. Faith without works is dead faith. Faith without works is dead. James constantly repeats this statement. You'll see several times as we walk down through verses 14 through 26. Faith without works is dead and so we continue on he gives examples of what faith in action looks like he gives two old testament saints one of abraham in relation to his son isaac we could see the other one as rahab the harlot as we move forward after abraham abraham was called to be uh, the friend of god If you look in Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham and Rahab both end up in the great hall of faith of people who believed God. It says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. We on the other side of the cross. I want you to understand Old Testament saints look forward to the cross for their salvation. They believe by grace through faith in the cross. They believe by grace through faith God and what he said. We on the back side of the cross look at the finished works of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And by in doing that, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And so he's appealing to the tribes of Judah or tribes of Israel by giving them their Old Testament examples. We can see here in verse 21 through 23, he says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? 
Now, I want you to understand it wasn't the action of him carrying, but it was the obedience of Abraham carrying and going up to the mountain there to sacrifice his son Isaac. It was his only son through his wife. He loved his son, and he, um, God told him to sacrifice him up there. And they packed the wood, and they got the knife, and they went up there, and they built the altar, and they started the fire. And I can imagine as uh, Isaac lays on the altar, and he raises the knife, and he's about to stab his uh, son and sacrifice his son on the altar. God tells him, stop. No, you have been obedient. And he gives them a sacrifice instead of his son. God says, Abraham, I want you to do this. And without hesitation, Abraham gets up and goes. This isn't the first time that Abraham exercises faith in what God has told him to do. He called him out of the land of the Ur of the Chaldees and tells him to go to a land he does not know. And in Genesis 15, 6, and I want you to understand the sacrifice of uh, his son is in Genesis 22, but in Genesis 15, 6, we'll see here in James 2, 22, it speaks of that. He says, seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was made perfect and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God. We can look in Genesis chapter 15. He's quoting Genesis chapter 15. Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Paul quotes the same portion of Scripture in Romans chapter number 4 in verse number 3. He's giving them an example of how Abraham's faith in God created in him action when God told him to do something he did it in church what has God called us to do here this morning simple as that love God love others share the gospel of Jesus Christ verse 24 through 25 we see Rahab the harlot he says see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only he says, likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way? Another Old Testament story, Rahab met, uh, made it into the great hall of faith in Hebrews chapter number 11. She actually became in the lineage of the birth of Jesus Christ, a harlot, a prostitute of all things, right? God's gracious and loving and can forgive Restore. God doesn't clean the fish before he catches it. He catches the fish before he cleans it. The children of Israel crossed over the dry land and over the Jordan River. They encounter this fortified city that seemed insurmountable. The name of that city was Jericho. A couple spies had been sent out to spy out the city to see the uh, inner workings and the outer workings of that city. And it was made known to the uh, inhabitants of that fortified city that there was two spies there of the Israelites. They had made their way through the city and Rahab lived on the wall there and she hid the spies. And when... The individuals came looking for the spies. They knocked on her door and they said, We're looking for these two spies who are spying out our city. She said, she said I don't know where they are at. They, they've gone and they've gone this way and that way and they left and they departed. And uh, She waited a while and the spies then left thereafter. And they said, you will be saved alone. And they said, let out a scarlet rope out of your window. And he says, and when we come to take and destroy the city, we will know who to save. And so Rahab, through her faith and believing in God and what he was going to do, was saved alive physically, but saved alive spiritually. And she earned her way in the lineage of Christ. Faith without works, church, this morning is dead. 
And so we get to the conclusion of the matter in verse number 26. We see here, for as the body without the spirit is dead. What is death? Separation, right? If we were to physically die, the soul and spirit would separate from this body. You'd probably embalm me, put me in a casket, lay me in the ground. And that body is no longer alive. So it says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, it's useless. It begins to decay. We're already decaying, but it begins to decay. He says, so faith without works is dead also. So we can understand that our works bring to life our faith. And so I want to encourage you here this morning, church. How are you living your Christian life? Does your faith have works of good deeds, of sharing the gospel, helping others, loving God, loving others? Or is your faith dead? Has no life. Has no purpose. Each one of you here, God loves you. He loves you. He has a purpose for you. He has a use for you. You're special to God. You belong. We talk about the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ with many members, and not just people members, but talking about the body as a physical body. How we have eyes, ears, fingers, and toes. Each one of you is special and can be used of God. How is God using you? How are you stifling God from using you? The book of Thessalonians talks about quench not the Spirit. Are you quenching the Spirit from working through your life? Are you allowing the Spirit to work through your life to help and reach others? If you were to go to the courtroom today, would there be enough evidence to convict you as being a Christian? Those who are here that might not know Jesus as your Savior. I've spoken a lot about faith in works. But the Bible talks about how simple believing in Jesus Christ is. For you are saved by grace through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans chapter 10 speaks about believing in our heart and confessing with our mouth the Lord Jesus and that he was raised from the dead, that we shall have eternal life. Romans 5, but God commendeth his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning? With every head bowed, with every eye closed, as we begin our invitation time. This is a time, I've had many people ask me because uh, they don't understand, I don't want to say they don't understand, but um, this is a time, the invitation time, that we use the steps as kind of an altar where people can come down and kneel and pray. It's a time where people can respond to the sermon if God touched or convicted their heart. It's that time where someone uh, wants to trust and receive Christ as their Savior. We'll take the Bible and show you how you can believe in Jesus Christ and have eternal life. This is just your opportunity to come do business with God. I'm going to pray. We'll stand to our feet. We'll sing a few verses of our song and then we'll be free to go Lord Jesus use this invitation time in the hearts and lives of our people here I pray that you spoke to their hearts and that uh, if there's someone here that doesn't know you as their Savior please allow them to come up and let me show them from the word of God how they can have eternal life in Jesus name I pray
Let's stand to our feet today, please.